Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Our listener support campaign continues. You can become one of our Patreon supporters with a donation of as little as $2 per month at patreon.greatdetectives.net. But our focus is on our one-time donations uh, today. You can support the show on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net. You can also send a donation with the Zelle app. Zelle is a a uh, feature linked to several different banks to allow mo- you to send money in between them. And I want to thank Stephen for sending a donation with Zell. Thanks so much uh, for that, Stephen. In addition, you can mail in a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. During the listener support campaign, we'll happily send you an ebook of your choice with a donation of $20 or more, uh, including Tales of the Dim Night, Slime Incorporated, All I Needed to Know I Learned from Columbo, and All I Needed to Know I Learned from Dragnet. With a donation of $100 or more, I'll happily order you a Great Detectives of Old Time Radio t-shirt. Also, at the $50 or $100 level, we have some fantastic uh, movies. Uh, The movies that we did, the Great Movies Over Radio series, as well as our previous summer series of the Summer of Bogart. We've got some Humphrey Bogart films uh, available to you with a donation of $50 or $100, depending on the film. A full list of available items is at support.greatdetectives.net. If you're listening to this on the air date and you're in the United States, happy Labor Day. Today we're going to bring you the first Mr. Keene episode of 1950. And 1950 is actually the year with the most Mr. Keene episodes in circulation. 18 in all, but no 1950 episodes after June the 15th. This is also the last year that Bennett Kilpack was the regular Mr. Keene actor. With that said, let's get into today's episode of Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, the original air date, January the 5th of 1950. This one is The Case of the Rushville Murder. It's time now for Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Anison and Kalinos present Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, one of the most famous characters of American fiction in one of radio's most thrilling dramas. Tonight and every Thursday at the same time, the famous old investigator takes from his file and brings to us one of his most celebrated missing persons cases. Tonight's case is entitled, The Case of the Rushville Murder. This program is brought to you by the makers of Anison, the remarkable tablets that bring incredibly fast and effective relief from the pain of headaches, neuritis, and neuralgia. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, it contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. Perhaps you, too, have been introduced to Anison this way. Then you know how effective Anison is. If not, try it yourself. Whenever you want incredibly fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, you'll be delighted with the results. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Just ask for Anison at any drug counter. It's spelled A-N-A-C-I-N. Anison. <laughs> Mr. Keene and the case of the Rushville murder. Our scene opens in the home of Dr. Prentice, a well-known physician and psychiatrist who resides in the small New Jersey community of Rushville. 
The doctor's daughter, a tall, lovely young girl, is just reaching for the telephone, which has been ringing insistently, as if aware of the urgency of this particular call. Hello? Laura, this is Dad. Oh, where are you, Father? At the hospital. But I'm coming right home, Laura. After I hang up, be sure to shut and bolt all the doors and windows. Why? What's happened, Dad? One of my patients has just escaped from the hospital. She's a homicidal maniac, Laura, and extremely dangerous. Father, there was something I wanted to tell you. Later, my dear. Right now, you do as I ask. This insane patient of mine is under the delusion that I'm her enemy, and she may head for the house immediately. I've already informed the police. All right, Father. And don't let anyone inside the house. I'll be home in 20 minutes. Goodbye, Laura. Goodbye. There. I've shut and locked all the windows. Who's there? Oh, no. No, we're not going to... No. No, don't touch me. Put down that knife. No! <laughs> My daughter was found by the police five minutes after I had phoned her, Mr. Keene. She'd been stabbed to death with a kitchen knife. Tell me, were all the windows and doors in your home locked as you had asked, Dr. Prentice? No, Mr. Keene. The windows were shut, but apparently Laura never had time to lock the back door that leads to the kitchen before Natalie Craven, the insane patient, reached the house. Saints preserve us. Dr. Prentice, your insane patient seemed to head for your home immediately after escaping from the hospital. Yes, that's a little odd in itself. But I told you how this patient felt about me, Mr. Keene. I'd treated her for a mental disorder for two years. But she developed a fixation about me and began to feel that I was her mortal enemy. Well, you were devoting your time to bring her back to sanity. Yes, Mr. Keene. But what I meant, Dr. Prentice, was this. You were in the hospital at the time of the insane woman's escape. Now, if she wanted to murder you, why didn't she attack you after you left the building? Why did she come to your home instead and attack your daughter? The mind of a psychiatic reacts, reacts in odd ways, Mr. Keene. This woman, Nettie Craven, may have thought I'd left the hospital. Then, finding I wasn't at home, she must have attacked my daughter, Laura, to revenge herself on me. Oh, I see what you mean, Doctor. Since the death of my wife, Mr. Keene, there have been only two things in my life. My work and my daughter, Laura. Laura is gone now. But I still have my work. And I intend to carry on. Naturally. I... I don't want Nettie Craven punished for the crime. She's completely insane. But she must be caught and returned to the hospital before she claims another victim. You, for instance, Dr. Prentice? Oh, I wasn't thinking of myself. I'm thinking of others. That's why I've come to you, Mr. Keene. The police are on the case, of course. And if an investigator of your ability also enters it and works along with them, the woman will be captured all the sooner. I intend to do everything I can, Dr. Prentice. Oh, thank you, Mr. Keene. Needless to say, you'll be doing a great public service. Yeah, but we're also thinking about you, Dr. Prentice. Oh, please don't worry about me, Mr. Clancy. Well, if you don't mind, I'd like to do a little prescribing in this particular case, Dr. Prentice. Uh, where is your home? In New Jersey, a town called Rushville. Well, Rushville is just across the river. That's right, Mr. Clancy. Dr. Prentice, I'd like to exchange house keys with you. I'd like you to stay in my apartment until this case is over. And Mike and I will stay in your house. But my work, Mr. Keene, my practice... Well, it'll be better for you to miss a few days' work now, Doc, than to end up with no work at all. You mean, you think Nettie Craven will try to make me her next victim? If this insane woman killed your daughter, yes. I insist that you take these precautions, Doctor. Well, in that case, I'll do as you ask, Mr. Keene. Fine. And be careful yourself. I needn't remind you that a homicidal case like Nettie's is most dangerous. Oh, I'm aware of that, Dr. Prentice. There's just one thing I'd like to add, Mr. Keene. If a young man named John Digby calls, try to break the news of Laura's murder as gently as possible. John is Laura's husband. A husband, eh? Was he living in your home too, Doctor? No. As a matter of fact, my daughter Laura had just come back to my house the day before... She and John were married only a month ago. They had a childish quarrel. I see. Oh, it was nothing at all, Mr. Keene. John's a fine boy, and I was certain I could have patched things up between them. You tried to notify him of Laura's death, didn't you, Dr. Prentice? Yes, but I couldn't reach him anywhere. Very well, Dr. Prentice. 
You can proceed to my home immediately. I'll notify the hospital you won't be available for a few days. Meanwhile, Mike and I will bend every effort to put our hands on this Rushville murderer before another victim is added to the list. Well, the light switch must be on this wall here, Mr. Keene, sir. Oh, here it is. Well, Dr. Prentice seems to have a very comfortable home, Mike. Well, sure, and it's too bad he lost his daughter. It's pretty tough for a man to go through something like that, Mr. Keene. Yes, but he still has his work, and he's one of the best in the profession. If we can... Boss, just a minute. I thought I heard someone move around the next room. Yes, you're right, Mike. There's someone here. Open that door. I'd better have my gun handy, just in case. Who are you? Stand where you are, mister. Don't move. What are you, thieves? No, young man. We happen to be working with the police. The police? What are you doing here in Dr. Prentice's home? Come to talk to my wife. His wife? This must be young John Digby, boss. Laura's husband. How did you know my name? Your father-in-law, Dr. Prentice, told us about you, John. My name is Keene. This is my partner, Mike Clancy. May I ask how you got into this house? Why, there was a kitchen window open. I didn't want to ring the front doorbell because I thought that Laura wouldn't let me in. We'd quarreled like a couple of silly kids, and she'd left me. I've come back to apologize to her. Saints preserve us, but she hasn't even heard. Heard what? Sit down, John. What is it? Why are you both looking at me like that? Where have you been for the past two days? I was so miserable after our quarrel. I went to a little town near Philadelphia. That explains why you didn't learn of the tragedy. What tragedy? It's going to be a shock, John, so prepare yourself. Your wife, Laura, was murdered. Laura? Murdered? By a maniac. No. No, I don't believe it. It's true. And I'm sorry. One of your father-in-law's patients, an insane woman, escaped from the hospital. And they think she attacked your wife. I should never have let Laura leave our apartment. It's all my fault, Mr. Keene. Sometimes fate works out things in her own peculiar way, John. And you think it was that maniac who killed Laura? Well, that's the general opinion. Well, it isn't my opinion. What do you mean, John? Mr. Keene, a few days ago, Laura was troubled by something important she wanted to tell her father. She started to tell me about it when I got home. But I interrupted her, and that's when we had our quarrel. You don't know what it was that worried your wife? I can guess. We fought because I was jealous, Mr. Keene. Jealous of a man named Arthur Halliday. And who is he, John? He used to be a medical student at the university in town. Dr. Prentice is a member of the examining board in that university. The board that passes on a student's character before he's permitted to graduate as a doctor. Yes, go on. Halliday drank a lot, gambled. The examining board found out and dismissed him from the medical school. They decided he was too weak to accept the responsibility a doctor must take. You say you were jealous of this Arthur Halliday? Yes, Mr. Keene. He, he used to see a lot of Laura before we were married. The other day, I saw them together on the street. She never told me she was seeing him. Now it's beginning to be clear to me. Halliday was probably trying to use Laura's influence with her father to... Have himself reinstated at the medical school. Mm. She refused and he made a threat. That's what she wanted to tell her father, Dr. Prentice, about. Well, you don't mind my saying so, John. You're taking a lot for granted. But it is worthwhile looking into, isn't it, Mr. Keene? If I ever find out that Arthur Halliday was responsible for Laura's death, I'll... I'll... Well, you look a little pale, young fella. News is too much to show a shock for him, Mike. Would you like to lie down inside for a while, John? Yes, sir. I think I'd better. I'll be all right, Mr. Keene. I... I just want to be alone for a few minutes. I'll answer that, Mike. Is... Is Dr. Prentice in, please? No, not at the moment. My name is Maud Craven. Craven? Mr. Keene, she must be related to that insane patient who escaped. She's my sister, sir. Come in, Miss Craven. My name is Keene. I happen to be looking for your sister. Mr. Keene, the famous investigator. 
Oh, you won't put Nettie in prison, will you, sir? She doesn't realize what she's doing. All I want is to return her to the hospital where she belongs. I, I know they're looking for Nettie. They think she murdered the doctor's daughter, Laura. I came here to tell Dr. Prentice how unhappy it made me when I heard about what happened. You know where your sister may have hidden, Miss Craven? If I did, Mr. Keene, I'd call the hospital. I know how dangerous Nettie is. I don't want to give her the chance to do to someone else what she did to poor Miss Laura. Excuse me for a moment, please. Hello? Dr. Prentice? He's not in the moment. Who's calling, please? Arthur Halliday. When will I be able to reach him? Why, very shortly. Is it important? I'll say it's important. To me, anyway. I... Who is this? A friend of the doctor's. Well, you can give him this message. He's kicked me around long enough. Because of him, I can't get into a medical school in the country. And if he doesn't stop hounding me, I'll square accounts. Hello? 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 Who was that, Mr. King? That was Arthur Halsey, Mike. A young medical student John Digby told us about. I wish I could have gotten his address. But if he was a student in the town university, they can tell you where to reach him, Mr. Keene. If you want me to, I'll... <gasps> what is it, Miss Craven? Oh, the, the window. Sense preservers. There's someone outside, boss. Yes, she's staring in the window. Look at that face. She looks like an animal. It's Nettie. It's my sister. Grab her, Mike. Mr. King. Isn't she there? There's no one in sight, sir. She's disappeared like a ghost, boss. It's too dark out here to see where she went. She couldn't have gotten far, Mike. Something tells me she's still close by. Come on. We're going to search every inch of these grounds. In just a moment, we'll return to Mr. Keene and the case of the Rushville murder. Meanwhile... Beware of unpleasing breath that breathes between the teeth. Use Kalinos toothpaste with dental floss action. Those crevices where food particles can decay must be reached for a clean mouth, welcome breath. Kalinos toothpaste gives you dental floss action. That is, sends thousands of cleansing bubbles to help dislodge bits of food that can cause unpleasing breath and decay. Kalinost is dentist recommended. Cleans teeth bright, keeps breath right, and listen, listen. Now save 31 cents on Kalinos toothpaste in the new giant economy size. Go to your dealers today. Take advantage of this great bargain. Save 31 cents on new giant economy size Kalinos. Get Kalinos toothpaste today. Now back to Mr. Keene and the case of the Rushville murder. Mr. Keene, the great investigator, and his partner, Mike Clancy are investigating the murder of Laura Digby, the married daughter of a well-known physician, Dr. Prentice, who's attached to a hospital for the insane. One of the patients, an insane woman named Nettie Craven, escaped from the hospital, and she's the one who was under suspicion for the crime. Now, Mike and Mr. Keene have just seen Nettie's face peering in through a window of Dr. Prentice's home, and as they search the grounds for her... She was standing right over here, Mr. Keene, near this window. Yes, she was, Mike, but I don't see any footprints. It's starting to snow, boss. Well, we'd better go back inside the house. Maybe Nettie Craven managed to slip away after all. Uh, Mike. Yes, boss. Come over here for a moment. Look at this. Why, it's a pair of doors leading right into the ground. No, it doesn't lead into the ground, Mike. It probably leads into the cellar of the house. Some of these old-fashioned houses have cellars built this way. Uh, see if you can open it, Mike. Well, I'd try. No. No, it won't budge, Mr. Keene. Betty must have bolted it on the inside. You think she's hiding in there? Yes. By now, she must be somewhere inside the house, Mike. Here, let me have your handcuffs. Here, here you are, Mr. Keene. We'll put these handcuffs through the rings on the cellar doors. And lock them from the outside. There we are, Mike. Now, she won't be able to get out the way she came in. Now, let's go back inside the house and find her. Mr. Keene, did you 
find my sister, Nettie? Not yet, Miss Craven. We think she's got inside the house through the cellar. She's in here? Why, you're not afraid of your sister, are you? I don't know, Mr. Keene. I used to be able to reason with Nettie, but lately she's been so violent. Well, you better stay right here in the living room while we make a search, Miss Craven. First, Mike, we'll phone the police in the hospital and tell them to send help. Well, here's the telephone, boss. Hmm. It's funny. What's the trouble, Mike? Well, it sounds like the phone is dead. Just a minute. Let's see where the phone wire runs to. Goes to this wall and runs along the woodwork to the window. Uh, open up the window, Mike. Well, Mr. King, the phone wire has been pulled right out of the outside wall. Mike, this window faces the side of the house where we saw Nettie Craven. Well, then Nettie Craven must have pulled the phone wire out just before she went through the cellar doors, Mr. Keene. There's a car coming down the driveway, Mike. Well, but he's not coming all the way, boss. He's stopping on top of that small hill where the driveway goes up and turns out to the main road. That's peculiar. Now he's put his headlights out. Mike, uh, search this house. See if you can find Nettie Craven. But be careful. I will, Mr. Keene. Get hold of John Digby to help you. I'm going outside again and see what our latest visitor is up to. Who's there? Who are you? My name is Halliday. Arthur Halliday, the medical student? The ex-medical student. If it wasn't for Dr. Prentice, I might have been practicing now. If your character had been what it should have, Dr. Prentice and the school board wouldn't have stood in your way. You must be the man I talked to on the phone a few minutes ago. That's right. My name is Keene. Get out of my way. It's Prentice I want to see. Now, just a moment. Do you happen to know that Dr. Prentice's daughter, Laura, has been murdered? Laura? Murdered? You didn't read about it in the papers? I... I just got back from New Orleans. I tried to get into another medical school down there, but they wouldn't have me. That's Dr. Prentice's fault, too. When a man has a bad reputation, it travels fast, Halliday. I'm not asking you for your opinion, Keene. I asked Laura to help me, but she wouldn't. So I decided to take matters into my own hands. Now get out of my way before I shoot. I had a feeling you were rather stealthy about your movements. Parking your car up there in the hill and sneaking down Dr. Prentice's driveway in the dark. That gun you have seems to bear me out. I'm going to get square, see? Prentice is my enemy. And if it's the last thing I look at. behind I... you, Halliday. Don't try and trick me. Your car, it's running wild. What? Jump, Halliday. <laughs> Put him over here on this couch, Mike. There. Easy now. His car rolled down the hill and smashed into the house after hitting Halliday. I don't think he's seriously injured, just stunned. I managed to push him partly out of the way. Well, Mr. Keene, how could a man be dumb enough to park a car on the hill with his handbrake off? The brake was on when I left it. Did you hear what he said, boss? Yes, Mike. That means someone deliberately released that handbrake. Hoping the car would roll down and kill the two of us. Where are John Digby and Maud Craven? Here I am, Mr. Keene. Well, what's happened? This man's been hurt, Miss Craven. Where have you been? I, I heard a noise upstairs and I went up to investigate. I hoped that I might be able to reason with my sister Nettie and save you trouble, Mr. Keene. You haven't left this house? No, Mr. Keene. Where's John Digby, Mike? Well, he wasn't in that bedroom where he went to lie down, boss. So I started to search the house by myself and... Just as I started down into the cellar, I heard the car crash and I... Get up! Dance preservers. What was that? Mr. Keene, it sounded like my sister, Nettie. Sounds like an insane person, all right. Enough to kill you to the marrow. Just listen to her. It's coming from the cellar, Mike. Come on, let's get down there immediately. Mr. Keene, stay where you are. For heaven's sake, don't move. It's John Digby, boss. Nettie Craven's standing behind him, Mike, with an axe in her hand. <laughs> yes, I'm Nettie Craven. 
Don't move, either of you. Do what she says, Mr. Keene. Or she'll bury that axe in the back of my head. Nettie, why do you want to harm John Digby? Who are you? I'm a friend of yours, Nettie. Are you? <laughs> Won't you put that axe down so we can talk? <laughs> I can talk with the axe in my hand. Where's Dr. Prentice? He's not here, Nettie. That's all they ever do is lie to me. Where is he? I told you, Dr. Prentice is not here. Tell him his patient here. Tell him the most beautiful patient he ever had is waiting for him. She's as mad as a hatter, Mr. Keene. Mad, am I? I'll show you who's mad! Nettie, wait. I think you're very clever, Nettie. Now, there's a man with sense. How long have you been hiding here in Dr. Prentice's house? None of your business. Do you know that it's snowing very hard outside? Snowing? Wasn't snowing when I came in. No, oh, you'll need rubbers when you go home. Or you'll catch a cold. Yes, I will. Wouldn't you like us to take you home in a car? A big car? A very big one. Where do you want us to take you? I want to see Dr. Prentice. Why? I... I don't know. I had a reason. I forget it now. Nettie... But... Do you want that ride? In the car? Yes. Yes, I'd love it. Then put the axe down. <laughs> She's dropped the axe. Grab her. Let grab me her. handle this, John. Nettie, did you kill Dr. Prentice's daughter, Laura? I n never killed anyone. But you once threatened Dr. Prentice, didn't you? Nettie? Nettie, what are you doing down there? Maud! It's my sister, Maud. Oh. oh, thank heaven you found her, Mr. Keene. Is everything all right? Yes, Miss Craven. Mike, you have an extra pair of handcuffs, haven't you? Oh, you, you're not going to handcuff my sister Nettie, are you? No, I believe I can handle Nettie with a little psychology. We're going to handcuff you, Maud Craven. Me? Put them on her, Mike. What for? The murder of Laura Dick. Oh, that's a lie! A few moments ago, you told me you never left that living room, Maud Craven. Yet your shoes were wet, and I saw snowflakes in your hair. You were outside the house, and you released the handbrake in Arthur Halliday's car. It was Nettie. She did it. No, more. I know that your sister Nettie has been inside since it started snowing, because her shoes are dry. The one who released that car brake and tried to kill Halliday and me was the one who murdered Dr. Prentice's daughter, Laura. You can't prove I did that. Oh, no. well, we'll see. There are fingerprints on that brake handle, no doubt. And I have a hunch they'll match with yours. But I was wearing gloves. Yes, of course you were. However, that admission is all I needed. <laughs> oh, you tricked me. You tricked me, Mr. Keene, just now the way Dr. Prentice did. How did he trick you? I thought he was in love with me, but he was only leading me on. <laughs> I knew you fell for him, Maud. I knew it all the time. You used to be there when he came to see me at the hospital to talk to me. I could see it in your eyes. <laughs> but he didn't fall for you. That's right, <laughs> Nettie. Stand up for him. One of the reasons I wanted to get rid of him was because of you. Don't you see, Nettie? Dr. Prentice was the one who said you were insane. He put you in that hospital. You know you hated him. Mr. Keene, look at Maud Craven's eyes. She looks as crazy as her sister Nettie. Yes, I know, John. It appears that both sisters are hopelessly insane. You fool, you idiots! If you tried to turn me in, you'll get what Laura got! So that's why you murdered Laura. She must have found out about your mental condition and was going to tell her father. Yes. That must have been why Laura was worried, Mr. Keene. Exactly, John. Your wife, Laura, found out that Maud Craven was as insane as her sister. But before she could inform the doctor, Maud entered the house and killed her. <laughs> Is Maud coming with us now? Yes, Nettie, she's coming with you. <laughs> and she's going to stay with you in the mental hospital. <laughs> Mark, I think we can take both of them away and consider the case of the Rushville murder as closed. <laughs> And so Mr. Keene finds the solution to the case of the Rushville murder.
The next time you are suffering from the pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, try Anison. You'll bless the day you heard of this incredibly fast way to relieve these pains. Now, the reason Anison is so wonderfully fast-acting and effective is this. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients in easy-to-take tablet form. Thousands of people have received envelopes containing Anison tablets from their own dentist or physician. And in this way have discovered the incredibly fast relief Anison brings from pain of headache, neuritis, or neuralgia. So next time such pain strike, take Anison. For most effective relief, use only as directed. Your druggist has Anison in handy boxes of 12 and 30 and economical family-sized bottles of 50 and 100. The name is Anison. A-N-A-C-I-N. Mr. Keene, Tracer of Lost Persons, is based on the novel Mr. Keene. The radio sequel is originated and produced by Frank and Ann Hummert. Dialogue by Lawrence Clee. Bennett Kilpank plays Mr. Keene. It is on the air every Thursday at this time. Don't miss Mr. Keene next Thursday when the kindly old Tracer turns to the case of murder on the sightseeing bus. This is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old-Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. You know, I, sometimes on these Mr. Keen episodes, I think the clues are far too simple. I don't think you have to get super complicated, don't get me wrong, but when the whole thing really comes down to wet shoes versus dry shoes, the thing with these amateur detectives is you really want them to have some special sort of insight, and wet shoes, dry shoes, that just doesn't do it for me. Despite the weak solution, though, I think they did do a good job of giving us a lot of suspects and a good chase. Just really would have liked a better clue at the end. All right, listener comments and feedback now. We have a few comments here. Joan writes, Hi, Adam, you were asking for some shows that you could use, and I was wondering about Sam Spade with Howard Duff. Just an idea. I haven't heard him for a while now. Hope you are doing well and... I I am too. Uh well thanks so much Joan. Um I uh in terms of uh Sam Spade, we are going to get to that series. It's another one of those that we do have planned down the road, though not as far down the road as some other series. Uh, but it'll still be a few years till we get to Sam Spade. But rest assured we are going to do that. Uh Stephen uh sends an email I listened to Down These Mean Streets as a result of a recommendation from one of your listeners. This week, he said he couldn't find any radio series with a blind detective. I feel like I've heard a series. I feel like he might be Chinese. I think he's a retired FBI agent or some other agency and is accompanied by a younger sighted agent. Do you know what I'm thinking of? Well, I'm not aware of any Golden Age radio program like you described. There was not, as far as I'm aware, a radio detective series with a blind detective. There was, however, an episode of Murder Clinic that featured blind detective Max Carados, a character featured in many short stories by Ernest Brahma. Some aspects uh, that you mentioned sound like the TV series Long Street, which featured an, an insurance investigator who had gone blind and who did receive training from uh, Bruce Lee. 
So that's my best guess on that. Sorry, but yeah, I, I don't know uh, that particular series, but it's definitely not a Golden Age uh, radio drama. Finally, I received a tweet from Tom, uh, who wrote uh, on Twitter, saw this on the boardwalk at Hampton Beach, New Hampshire, and made me think of the radio programs you present. And it is a Rexall drug sign. And Rexall drug stores were a sponsor of Richard Diamond. Of course, even beyond that, Rexall sponsored other uh, Golden Age programs, including the Jimmy Durante program. And occasionally people will see these, you know, when they are traveling and they'll uh, send the picture because it's somewhat unusual to see. Rexall does still have a presence. It's not this, you know, huge nationwide thing. It was during the golden age of radio, but they seem to have stores uh, here and there, druggists who still have the Rexall uh, signs up. Uh, I, gr I spent... Uh, like four or five years of my teenage years in Eureka, Montana. And uh, that town, a population of about a thousand, still actually had a Rexall drugstore. Uh, and here's another one over in New Hampshire. In Hampton Beach, population 2,275. So pr probably quite a few small towns that still have Rexalls. All right. Well, that will do it for now. Join us back here tomorrow for That Strong Guys. We start off that series. And uh, we'll be back next Monday with another episode of Mr. Keen, Tracer of Lost Persons. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. A reminder, you can support the program on a one-time basis at support.greatdetectives.net by using the Zell app and sending to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Detectives.net, or by mailing in a donation to Adam Graham, P.O. Box 15913, Boise, Idaho, 83715. And during our listener support campaign, if you do uh, that, send in a donation of $100 or more, uh, you, we can send you uh, your copy of Poirot's Finest Cases or more of Poirot's Finest Cases as an iTunes download. Just be sure to provide your iTunes-related uh, email address. And that'll be all for now from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.